Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest WDDTY Talks webinar. And we are especially uh, honoured to have a true health pioneer with us today uh, in Dr. Thomas E. Levy. His credentials are something to behold. He is a certified, board certified cardiologist and a bar certified attorney, which must make you quite unique. And you've been inducted into the Ortho Molecular Medicine Hall of Fame. At the last count, as far as I was aware, he's written 11 books, including Curing the Incurable, Rapid Virus Recovery, and Magnesium Reversing Disease, and The Hidden Enemy. Um, I was actually just perusing the uh, Curing the Incurable today. It's absolutely fantastic and should be on everyone's bookshelf. So, Dr. Levy, a great honor to have you with us today and uh, sparing the time. Thank you so much, sir. Um, the format will be, we're going to talk for about half an hour, and then we're throwing the floor open to all of you to ask your own questions of Dr. Levy, who's very graciously agreed to uh, answer as many as he can. And uh, we have sort of overseeing events, Molly. Molly, could you just explain to everyone how they can post a question if they're not entirely sure how to do that? Yep, of course, if you hover over your Zoom screen, there's a little button at the bottom, an icon that says Q&A, click that and then just pop your questions there and then I can feed them to Dr. Levy when we're ready. Fantastic. And so, and so Molly will be monitoring all your questions. So get them on, get them on as, you, as we talk and we'll do our best to answer them in the second half of the, of the show. Dr. Levy, thank you again for joining us. It's, uh, it's a great, great honor. Um, My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Brian. No, no, it's, it's very rare we get a true pioneer like you. I mean, Linus Pauling's gone, and you're you're the you're, you're the new guy on the block. So fantastic. Well, those are very kind words. I appreciate. Well, they 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 they're fairly deserved, Doctor Levy. Um, the standard RDA, the recommended daily allowance for vitamin C, is at the last count, ninety milligrams. Is that enough? Well, that's if the RDA stands for ridiculous daily allowance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, the, these RDAs are, are, if they're based in anything scientific at all, they're based on how much you need of something just to not drop dead the next day. Right. So uh, they're, they're not. And the other thing, too, about vitamin C is, and this is important to understand, I believe, is that it does have vitamin-like qualities, which means... Uh, if you become depleted of it, you get a deficiency disease called scurvy, a fairly small amount of it will bring you out of that. And this is how we evolve these tiny amounts, because a fairly tiny amount of vitamin C can pull you out of flagrant scurvy. However, and we can go into the reasons why later, perhaps, the body requires massively larger amounts of vitamin C than is required there. And it's best regarded as, believe it or not, not only a nutrient, but the body's primary nutrient. Uh, mm -hmm. Nutrient is anything at the molecular level that is capable of reduction, donating electrons <clears throat> and repairing oxidized biomolecules. And so vitamin C fits that bill perfectly. And with its distribution throughout the body, using all the glucose transporters, <clears throat> so that um, insulin, for example, holds vitamin C inside of the cell, just like it does glucose, Hmm. All of these things are show really why vitamin C is the ideal antioxidant and why it's <laughs> almost disparaging to call it a vitamin right. because it's just so much more than that. Right. So, so if 90 is not enough other than to prevent scurvy, how much do we actually need to maintain decent health? I'm glad you, <clears throat> I'm glad you phrased it decent health versus hmm. optimal health. Okay. okay, because because uh, there's a big difference there right. you know, between being, getting by and having a few right. minor difficulties and getting through the day and having a few flashes of feeling well versus really feeling well. We know how much vitamin C we need from the e example in the animals. Okay, animals have livers that produce vitamin C from glucose in a four enzyme sequence. And the last enzyme is something called L-galonolactone oxidase. That's not important to know the name, but it's, if you see the abbreviation GULO, that's what it's referring to. 
in the human being, <laughs> who knows when, how, why, or whatever, uh, we lost the function of this fourth enzyme. And for the most part, there are rare exceptions. For the most part, nobody in the population can any longer make vitamin C uh, from the glucose in their liver. But that doesn't mean we've lost the amount of, of need that we have for it. When you take, for example, a 150 pound goat, that's about uh, 70 kilograms. <laughs> and a 70 kilogram goat will synthesize on a regular basis six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 grams of vitamin C and secrete it directly into the blood for maintenance. And if you give that goat a life-threatening infection or toxic challenge, it can start making 20, 30, 40, 50 grams of vitamin C during that period of time. Again, directly IV. I keep emphasizing directly IV because if you're not taking vitamin C intravenously, like most of us are not, you're still only getting a small percentage of the vitamin C inside your system. So when you say, what's a decent amount? Well, a decent amount would be what it took to, um, to give you that baseline on the goat. And that would be far in excess of the amount that the goat makes. So practically speaking, most people should be on the order of two to three grams, right. two to three times a day. Right. That does not mean they cannot benefit from very, very much more. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, you were talking about that little uh, experiment Dr. Honeyhacky and I did uh, before we got online, is that <clears throat> they actually have a polyphenol called hydroxytyrosol that comes from olive leaf extract, in which studies have been do done that show it actually seems to unblock the genetic block for transcribing the enzyme an epigenetic defect, not a genetic defect. And when you take this, most people that will be tested so far start making their own vitamin C. Point being also, it's something that we lose. When we're newborns, we make vitamin C. Huh. But as the days go by, we lose that ability. Presumably, presumably, due to one or more of the many different toxins that we face on a daily basis, just selectively attacks that part of the metabolism. So bottom line, long answer to your short question is uh, uh, a decent amount of vitamin C would be six to eight grams a day. Uh, any amount greater than that is fine, but also important for people not to be frustrated and think it's of no use. If your finances are limited, I mean, by all means, at least take 500 to a, 500 milligrams to a gram a day, because that still can make a huge amount of difference in the quality of your baseline health. Right. I mean, the critics of, of, of high dose uh, vitamin C say, oh, you just pee it away anyway. How true is that statement? You pee everything away, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not having any benefit, put it that way. That's right. I mean, that's that's truly, and, and I know I've heard it many times, but that's yeah. one of the most most patently asinine comments I've ever heard offered uh, <laughs> against vitamin C. Uh, everything you eat, everything you take up, you uh, retain part of it, and you excrete part of it, and you use it up, and you excrete it. So, uh, the point is, is you need to get enough in there so that the amount that gets absorbed right. There's nothing that goes. 100% in the body, and right. none of it comes out. So, uh, right. so no, that's, to me, that, that just shows the incredible <laughs> ignorance of people that would say something like that, that mm. apparently don't have a desire to be right. Because mm. if they would sit down and talk to you for 10 seconds, uh, you would see that they really don't know what they're talking about. And they just have a preconceived notion, and they're going to stick to it come hell or high water. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, a slightly controversial question, but do you think that our inability to synthesize, produce vitamin C ourselves is a major contributor to the chronic disease epidemic we're seeing? Much more than major. <laughs> the, oh. the primary reason. The primary really? reason. Really? Uh, and that's the other thing, too, that whenever you look at laboratory testing and you see reference range, or they call it normal range, those are ranges of laboratory data hmm. that strive to put the vast majority of the population in the normal range. 
So when you have something that's truly affecting well over 95% of the population, uh, it's very hard to accurately validate what a given lab test should be because what is normal if 95% of the population being tested is abnormal and in mm. a state, not exaggerating, of pretty much subclinical scurvy at all times. I mean, what is your theory as to why we lost that ability to... <laughs> you Because you, 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 you mentioned toxins earlier. Yeah, toxins. Do you, do you think that's uh, an, obviously an environmental factor there? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you can, <laughs> I, uh, you, you could be a science fiction writer and come up with some good explanations too as to uh, right, right. what would be the best way to incapacitate the human population <laughs> by an <laughs> alien race, program out our ability to make vitamin C. Right. Now, uh, I, I don't say that completely laughingly, but there's a lot of people that would tell you that. that Regardless right? of how it happens, uh, yes, I think every, but let's put it this way. Everything that bad that's happened to us and happens and is happening to us comes from excess oxidation of the wrong biomolecules. Yeah. So I have no doubt, I don't know which it is, I have no doubt that a baby that comes into this world making vitamin C just fine, that gradually loses the ability over the six, first six months, 12 months, 18 months of life, what else could it be except some undesirable toxin that's... Uh, uh, intercalating itself in the wrong spot uh, somewhere around the DNA or in this end or the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's the ribosomes and the mRNA. There's all these other things that could get attacked that would screw it up. The thing is, is <clears throat> what's been identified with this is that normally you have the ribosome attached to the messenger RNA and go like a zipper, write down, read it and produce the amino acids to make the protein. However, they have things called stop codons, and apparently the toxicity, if that's what the case is, a stop codon is sitting there right in the middle of the zipper, and so the zipper goes down that far, gets blocked, it can't go any further, and you produce either an incomplete, useless protein or no protein at all. And they have a phenomena called read-through in the genetic literature that talks about some ways that you can get around these stop codons. And so without really knowing the mechanism, uh, it would appear that something like hydroxytyrosol in olive leaf extract causes a facilitation of the read-through phenomenon so that you get a 90, 95% complete protein, which can still do the job. Okay. I mean, you started life as an innocent cardiologist with no particular thoughts of vitamin C. So how did you come to, to become such an advocate of it? You know, that's an interesting story. I'll, I'll try not to make it too elongated because uh, back in 1993, I was a cardiologist practicing regular old cardiology. And I got to confess, I was sitting up there, wasn't seeing a patient that afternoon, had my feet cocked up on my desk. And I was saying to myself, actually, well, you know, cardiology is good. You've helped a lot of people. There's some people that clearly would have been dead if you hadn't gotten to them in time. So you're not useless like so many other subspecialties of medicine, which I realized even then. Mm. And I said, but this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm. I don't know what it is I want to do, but it's not this. And for those who have a metaphysical ilk in them, we have this expression called when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Oh. Literally, within several weeks to a month after those musings in my office, I met Dr. Hal Huggins in Colorado oh. Springs, oh. the first true biological dentist on the planet. And yeah. Dr. Huggins began my real medical education. Oh. E everything else up to that point in time was just a foundation for being able to intellectually assimilate true concepts. And I more or less, not more or less, completely gave up my cardiology practice to be a consultant to Dr. Huggins at his clinic. Wow. Uh, early on, I saw this little old neurologically damaged lady in a wheelchair getting extensive dental work, several hours worth. And I poked my head in and every time I did, she's getting brighter and more. Uh, I said, what's going on here? She, she's getting stronger and healthier, the more we're traumatizing her mouth. 
And I said, how, what's going on? And he pointed at the IV bag. I said, okay, I know about IVs. What's in it? He says, 50 grams of vitamin C. Oh. And that just blew me away. Right. Like everybody else on the planet, uh, oh, vitamin C, oranges, blah, blah, blah. That was it, you know. Yeah. Sure, it's good for you. Of course, it's good for you. And, but literally, you know, mm. I, I'm not in the habit of denying what I witness. Mm. And what I witnessed could not be explained by any modern med medical principle mm. other than the fact that 50 grams of this crazy substance called vitamin C was causing something completely unheard of, at least in the quote unquote modern medicine community. And mm. literally with the flip of a switch, uh, it was at that point that my vitamin C journey began. And oh. about four or five years later, I had written Cure in the Incurable. Ah, and of course, that journey took you to a guy I'd actually, I didn't actually know about him. We all know about Linus Pauling when we talk about vitamin C, but Dr. Frederick Fenner was, was a guy who came up, and I know he's one of your heroes, and you dedicated the book to him. And he was an extraordinary man, wasn't he? I mean, he was a, a pioneer in the 40s, and he was treating small children with polio and reversing their polio with very high doses of vitamin C. I mean, quite extraordinary. He was giving up to, I mean, I think he was using up to 50 grams on, on these small children, which by the way, if you're not sure in your maths, is 500 times the RDA. <laughs> That's right. Well, you uh, know, with, with Dr. Oh, Clitter, um, I, I really resent how the term genius gets thrown around these days. Somebody gets an idea, they're a genius. Michael Jordan sinks a basket, he's a genius. Everybody's a genius, okay? Right. Well, Frederick Kletter, if he's not a genius, he's the closest thing to it because consider the situation. It was like 1936, 37, something along those lines, Dr. Albert St. Georgie discovered vitamin C and won the Nobel Prize for that. Mm -hmm. And then within a few years, Dr. Klenner somehow got together with some pharmaceutical companies and encouraged them to make multi-gram doses of vitamin C. Why? To just suddenly give intravenously to, to kids and adults with infectious disease? Where on earth did that come from? Where are, I mean, he was spot on. Mm. He was spot on because mm. that is the absolute therapy for those conditions. And if you get mm. it done right, correct dosage, correct timing. Uh, there's not an uh, acute infection, especially viral, that you're not going to quickly resolve. And yeah. of course, that includes polio, where yeah. Dr. Klenner cures 60 out of 60 cases right. uh, between three and five days. Right. So that's genius. That's genius. I mean, there's there nothing before Klenner, to my knowledge, that yeah. even remotely suggested taking massive multigram doses of vitamin C yeah. was going to put you into a whole new world of health. Yeah, and he went on from there and did so many other things. I mean, it's, vitamin C is, is a, an antibacterial and an antiviral, isn't it? And Absolutely. Your book, I mean, the list in your book is essentially all the vaccines that kids are supposed to take. And here it was, presumably prevents as well as treats. those. Well, conditions. that's the whole point, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's why although I have my certain own opinions, I feel qualified quite scientifically based on, on so many vaccinations, not just the COVID ones, but the many, many other childhood ones, in my opinion, long-term doing more harm than good, even if the childhood diseases that they purportedly would prevent, like chickenpox, et cetera, was chopped down by a healthy percentage, there's still not that many kids that are going to get chicken pox and have horrible secondary complications, whereas they still have lots of people that get neuro neurological syndromes, guillain barre syndrome, all this from all of the vaccinations. But you brought up the whole point is there's no need to even address, in my opinion, or get into the vicious circle of back and forth uh, venom uh, when it comes to talking about the benefit of vaccines and the toxicity of vaccines, because there's not a single thing for which a vaccine is offered that vitamin C, with the help of a few other things, but mostly vitamin C, 
will not prevent and or completely cure if contracted. Yeah. And since you wrote, wrote your books, I mean, of course, we've had COVID. I mean, we've, we're we aware of hospitals who are treating patients very successfully with high dose vitamin C, or they had to keep it quiet. What is your, what's your take on that? Oh, it's, 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 the, it's the therapy of choice. Uh, one thing to keep in, keep in mind is that vitamin C is like doing two things at the same time. By that, I mean, anytime you get an infection, no matter what it is, it's creating large amounts of oxidative stress. It's oxidizing lots of biomolecules. And no matter what you use, if you do nothing else, that infection is steadily putting the patient into a greater and greater and greater degree of acute scurvy. This is why the hemorrhagic fever people, the Ebola's and all die. They get a massive destruction of the vitamin C, they lose capillary integrity and they bleed to death, okay? So number one, all infections, if they're not turned around, at the same time they're infecting you, they're putting your body into a state of scurvy. So even if the vitamin C didn't help deal with the infection per se, you would still want to take it to reinforce the immune system of those patients while they were fighting the infection. But as it turns out, vitamin C is also incredibly elegantly perfect as a natural antibiotic. <clears throat> there are a number of different mechanisms, I don't think we need to go into them, called the Fenton reaction, how vitamin C inside a pathogen-laden cell just uh, donates an electron to iron, which donates it to hydrogen peroxide, which breaks down into hydroxyl radical, and destroys everything there. And you continue the vitamin C until the infection is gone. So it's twofold, twofold. Yeah. It directly assaults the infective agent and it immediately cures or helps alleviate the acute mm -hmm. induced scurvy that's being caused mm -hmm. by, the, by the infection itself. Right, and you, you've taken it further and you, 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 you believe it can reverse cancer and heart disease and which might sound controversial to some people. So I'll just speak to that for a moment myself because my own mother had end stage breast cancer, stage four, she had given three months to live and she was put on, I think about eight gram twice a week IV and in six months she was completely well. So, um, yeah, but I know you do, you do say that as well. I mean, um, it, presumably it's a similar mechanism that's going on with these diseases as well. Yeah, and, and one thing, I, I, not, to be, not to be snide or anything like that, but I don't refer to it as a belief. It's not a religion. Every, everything I talk about <laughs> is scientifically <laughs> based. You know, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> go to the altar of vitamin C and, uh, and make the sign of the cross and say, peace, heal me. I mean, if prayer is good as well. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> okay. So uh, the thing about cancer is cancer is oxidative stress squared. Okay. That's, uh, it's just like the ultimate uh, in disease formation when you get your oxidative stress in a certain area of the body so highly 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 concentrated i'm glad to hear your mother's doing well however if she didn't have this done she needs to get it done tomorrow brian hmm. if she needs to get a 3d cone beam exam of her mouth okay. 80 85 percent of all breast cancer comes from infected root canals and other teeth right. draining into the breasts okay so right. just because you got out of the woods this time don't think you've slammed the door in the face of that until you get rid of the dental infection and toxicity. And this is covered in one of my books, uh, Hidden Epidemic. I told you before, mm -hmm. anybody that sends me an email, I can give you a free download of that book along with our other information sources. Because for someone to have a heart attack or to get breast cancer and never get their mouth evaluated is missing the single most important factor in not only stopping the progression of those diseases, but re re reversing them and curing them. Mm, right. And, and you, you've, I mean, I think that's one of the early sort of signals for you when you worked with Howe, wasn't it? About the, the, I mean, it goes back to Western Price and people about the infected gums, that's inflammation right. causing heart disease and, and the rest. So that's, that's essential for that. And, and also dental implants too, as being part of that. Uh, <clears throat> Infected dental implants. I got to say, mm -hmm. uh, Hal was not crazy about implants at all, but as a non-dentist, I acknowledge my non-dental background. Uh, 
I think today's materials, mm. zirconium and some other things, uh, along with the more sophisticated placement, because they use this cone beam examination to help perfectly guide where the most bone is and everything else. I think for most people, uh, implants are an expensive, but a very good uh, alternative uh, after you after you lose a tooth. So uh, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, I have the, obviously the highest okay. regard for Hal, but I'm not I'm not completely anti-implant. I have one myself. Okay. Uh, before we sort of pass over to the questions, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of them. I'd just like to quickly go through uh, the six parameters of healing that you outlined in in your book, uh, curing the incurables, and and you said you know vitamin C can work depend upon these six things the first was in the right form so could you explain that well anybody's condition has is either acute or chronic or subacute somewhere in between uh, and different diseases affecting different parts of the body <clears throat> play a significant role in what vitamin c would be best uh, for example problems with the gut uh, it's great in that case to take a lot of sodium ascorbate powder and actually induce the C flush, the flushing, because what's happening at the same time that you're flushing the bile out is you're also putting a lot of vitamin C and directly neutralizing the toxins that are present in the gut to deal with that. And the toxins that after it gets past those toxins, it goes into the tissue around the intestine where you have the highest density of immune cells anywhere in the body. So, uh, and it's also probably the most economic way to take vitamin C too. Uh, I mean, uh, the liposome encapsulate is great, but for somebody with limited resources uh, and a little bit of discipline, I say discipline because uh, you're not gonna get the optimal benefit from sodium ascorbate powder if you just take it once a day. You should be taking it in divided doses throughout the day uh, a greater percentage of each dose gets absorbed when you spread it out. And uh, so, so yeah, that, that has to do with uh, the type of disease you're treating, where it is, where do I want to get the vitamin C in highest doses most quickly? Okay. All right. Well, your second uh, parameter is with the proper technique, presuming the administration of it. That's a good explain on that. Well, you know, <clears throat> uh, it's kind of funny. Dr. Rod Honeyhackey at the Reardon Clinic has given over 150,000 vitamin C IVs, most of them 50 grams or more over the last 32, 33 years. He's never had a hemolytic anemia from G6PD. He's never had a precipitated kidney stone. Uh, he's never had anybody tremendously uncomfortable so that they had to discontinue the IV. Yet I still hear people all the time and I don't know if they really believe this or they just have a little vested interest in something else and they're trying to give it support, but, oh, I don't give vitamin C, it burns the veins and this out of the other. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe they're putting something in the IV that does burn it, but that's not par for the course, not even close. Mm. Uh, when you put give a, not, a properly buffered uh, vitamin C IV, usually with a little magnesium, maybe, maybe not some B vitamins and things like that. Uh, I mean, at the very worst, you might find somebody, if you're really running it fast, feeling a little pressure, but burning, if, if an IV burns, you need to take it out and restart it because a lot of times it's just mm. not right place in the vessel. But right. bottom line is there's, and so that's uh, without even going into the further details, that has to do with technique. There's, I've, <laughs> it seems to me so simple and straightforward, yet I still continue to get feedback. Again, mm. I don't know the motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, for people that say, oh, well, I, I don't do that. It hurts too much. I mean, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Okay. And you said in frequent enough doses. I mean, of course, dependent upon the <laughs> severity of the disease, presumably, depends how many times it should be given. Frequent is really important uh, in an acute, rapidly progressing infectious disease. Okay. For example, uh, if you have somebody in septic shock, um, and you want to give them 100 grams. Well, giving them 100 grams all at once over a couple hours is fine, but he will benefit even more if you give 25 grams every six hours. Right. Okay. Right. Keep the blood levels up. 
All right. So, <clears throat> and it's really that simple. I mean, most of the time, if you're not in a life threatening situation, just getting one big IV, usually in the clinic, off you go, that's fine. But the fact of the matter is that modern medicine has cracked down really hard on vitamin C and it's still almost impossible to find a hospital where you can get vitamin C administered intravenously. So we don't have the advantage of giving something every six hours. Hmm. So we're forced to compromise. How much can we give during the span of a clinic visit? Right, right, okay. And you say in high enough doses, again, we, we touched upon that, but do you- Yeah, I, I like to say there's a, a three, what, what are the three most important factors in real estate? <laughs> okay. Location, location, location. <laughs> then the corollary of that is, <clears throat> what are the three most important factors in French cooking? Butter, butter, and butter. <laughs> well, the three most important factors in vitamin C efficacy is dose, dose, and dose. Mm -hmm. And literally, it almost sounds crazy when there's so many things out there mm -hmm. that have toxicity if you push too hard. Mm -hmm. Almost always, I mean, there's exceptions to every rule, but almost always, if you're not getting the desired result that you want, you're not giving enough. Right. Simple as that. Okay. And, and you saw you there. And, are... and it's important too, because so many people, let me say this, so many yeah. doggone practitioners out there now yeah. are warming up to the idea of vitamin C, but they've got this pathological fear of going above 25 grams. And I mean, it just blows their mind to think of giving 50. Well, at the Reardon Clinic, they give 50, 75, 100, 150, 250 grams a day okay oh. so so stop the needless fear and and realize as much good as you do with 25 grams very often times you don't see the real magic if you will until you pass the 50 gram point wow okay all right and um you say additional agents are required i mean i know you've been really looking at magnesium recently is that is that one <clears throat> important with that Magnesium is so, so doggone important. Mm -hmm. Magnesium deficiency makes all diseases worse. End of story. All diseases. And it's the primary cause of many different diseases. And it's very, very poorly absorbed. I, I like to make the statement, hmm. don't ever pass up the opportunity when you get an IV for any reason at all, not to have a couple grams of, of magnesium chloride. But mm -hmm. so far, it's okay. But magnesium chloride yeah. added to it because... This gets inside the cells very effectively. And, uh, and, and just getting it uh, intravenously gives you a much longer lasting effect. So, so yeah, that's, that's the primary thrust of the uh, additional agents. Okay, and the final- And you know, there's other things you can do too. I mean, there's a lot of other good things you can put in an IV. I don't routinely put it in a, a vitamin C IV, but if, if I do it once and it's well tolerated, there's no reason not to. There's there's things like uh, NAD now that can be added to an IV, uh, sometimes even DMSO if you're taking other agents orally that you want to get inside, okay. uh, adding insulin in different doses. Remember, insulin pushes both glucose and vitamin C inside the cell. And this is what makes insulin such a powerful, powerful healing agent is because it's probably the single best way to acutely elevate vitamin C levels inside your cells. Okay. And, and the final parameter is for long enough, which presumably is until the long enough. It's good. And there's, there's a moral in this story too. <clears throat> long enough means at least 24 and preferably 48 hours past complete apparent clinical normalcy. Okay. Okay. So somebody feels perfect, you hit them for another 24 hours with the same regimen to get there. Okay, right. it's uh, it's something peculiar. I haven't figured out about a lot of infectious diseases. Whereas if if you just if you just take your take your foot off the accelerator a little bit, they'll come roaring back. Right. Okay. Before I pass the the, the, the mic over to our to our viewers, just one last question that hangs in the air for me, and I I just doesn't make any sense. And that is that you know extraordinary the work of Klenner and and and, and yourself and others. Subsequently, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of studies into the efficacy of vitamin C. Why is it not just part of everyday medicine? Oh, you're going to get me really being cynical here. <laughs> okay. 
that presumes, and it's a bad presumption, that the primary goal of medicine is to make people better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. We'll leave it there. All right. <laughs> now, 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 before we pause on, uh, Dr. Levy is very, very generously um, given Molly his email. He can't consult but he can give you more information. If you feel your question's not being answered this evening and you want more, he's very, very kindly given his email. Not many people do that, so thank you for that. And you, you've touched several times on the fact that this stuff is expensive, which it is. I mean, Lynn and I, we, we take two to three grams of vitamin C every day. Uh, liposomal, which we get from a lovely company called Altrian, and Altrian are offering everyone a 20% discount on their liposomal vitamin C as well as their entire product range. And I think it's an offer that's good for seven days after this talk. So wonderful stuff. So there's an opportunity, opportunity for everyone to try this if they haven't already. And let so, me add this, if I might, Brian, yeah, is sure. uh, I, if, you can, if you can find a way in your budget, the Altria, the Altria product is the way to go. It just... It gets vitamin C inside the cell more right. quickly and more effectively than anything else. Right. And I've had numerous occasions with myself, family, and friends <clears throat> where I've had, did not have access to intravenous vitamin C, yet I was able to push extremely hard on that dosing yeah. and got the resolution of an infection even after all antibiotics had failed. Right. So, it's, And right. the other thing too, again, if you have the economic means, it gives you a little more freedom. Why do I say that? We said the sodium ascorbate, you want to do two, three, four times a day. Something like the Altriate is really effectively a long-acting form of vitamin C because once you get it, it goes inside the cell and it yeah. traps there and it's not available to be excreted out the urine. Right. I mean, we laughingly said earlier about you pee it out, but a genuine worry with high-dose vitamin C is, is diarrhea gut reactions, which, again, the liposomal form does bypass. That's so correct. Yeah, so that that's that's certainly why we all take it at home here, and it's very much part of our health regime. And your chance to to try that with a great discount offer, Molly. Some questions, I'm sure there are. Did yeah, you... there are a lot of questions. Okay, <laughs> okay, all right. Um, the first, well, we've had a couple of on this topic actually about surgery. So, is there an should they be taking vitamin C either before or after surgery or both and can it help with recovering from surgeries? Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, I mean, surgery is trauma. Trauma breeds oxidation and oxidative stress. Uh, vitamin C, both directly by supporting uh, and reversing oxidative stress, it's also the primary stimulant to the immune system. So yes, you take it before. If you have an open-minded surgeon, you take it during <laughs> take it after and continue taking it daily until you have complete healing. Although obviously you want to continue to take it daily for the rest of your life, but you might take a lesser dosage for the rest of your life than what it takes to get over the healing of whatever surgical procedure it is you're undergoing. Okay. Perfect. Um, another one, is there any vitamin or other nutrient slash medicine that negates the effect of vitamin C and that should therefore not be taken with vitamin C? Hmm. You know, I don't know of any nutrient. I mean, there are toxins. I mean, there are toxins that could uh, neutralize the effect of vitamin C and vice versa. But uh, I don't know of any direct nutrient. Remember a nutrient, by my definition, a nutrient is anything that when it's finally metabolically broken down, you're left with a molecule that has antioxidant and electron donating properties. So, so no, I'm not aware of any type of nutrient that would conflict with vitamin C. Just, just be additive and sometimes synergistic. Um, another question, is sodium ascorbate more effective than azorbic acid? Sorry about the pronunciation. You know, there's been a lot of debate about this. It seems like none of it based on science. Uh, I think Dr. Cathcart, who I have great deal of respect for. He's passed. He's one of our vitamin C pioneers. Uh, I believe it was his assertion that ascorbic acid was more potent than sodium ascorbate. That said, that's not been my experience, okay? 
you're going for the ascorbate anion. So sodium ascorbate and then uh, ascorbic acid is hydrogen ascorbate. So it's just sodium or hydrogen plus the ascorbate. The ascorbate is the guts of vitamin C. So the only thing that goes on with the cations, which is the hydrogen ions and the sodium ions, is do they have any independent effect? And to my knowledge, neither of them have any independent effect on the type of things that vitamin C resolves. Okay, neither sodium nor hydrogen ions. On the other hand, <clears throat> many people are very sensitive to the extra hydrogen and ascorbic acid and get an upset stomach when taking it. That's not gonna be the case with sodium ascorbate. Uh, and I might add also for people that are also wondering about high blood pressure and sodium overload. Sodium ascorbate does not cause volume overload. Uh, there are papers out there that show what increases blood pressure and increases blood volume is sodium chloride, not sodium bicarbonate, not sodium ascorbate, not sodium anything else, but sodium chloride. So when you're taking sodium uh, along with an anion other than chloride, it does not have an effect on your blood pressure. So that should not be a concern or a consideration. Great, um, another question is, are there any contraindications for vitamin C? Well, uh, not really, okay? The only contraindication would be, uh, and it wouldn't be a contraindication, there are times, not many times, where you might wanna use a lesser dose. If you have somebody with uh, chronic renal failure and complete renal shutdown, they're not making any urine at all, uh, you, the, your nephrologist or doctor needs to make sure that you're taking the amount of vitamin C where the oxalate and the byproducts of the vitamin C can be successfully taken out during dialysis along with the, all the other toxins that accumulate. Outside of that, no. Okay. Um, we've had so many questions asking where and how they can get an intravenous vitamin C. They said, but yeah, so many people have asked how it's actually possible to get it in the UK and the US. Well, I mean, we have lots of clinics in the US. Again, like I said, the hospitals still have a pretty rigid ban on vitamin C intravenously. <clears throat> I don't know what the availability situation is in, in the UK, but uh, I'd, I'd go online like everybody else and, uh, and begin your search there. I know you have some clinics, they try, obviously, to maintain a low profile. So <clears throat> you're not going to see most of the time, unless the doctor's a little freewheeling, you know, big banners on their website about you might find one thing down in the corner that says IV therapies. And then you make a phone call and you say, well, can those IV therapies include IV vitamin C and get your answer? Because they're just not going to wave a red flag in some of these irrational, irrational and evil public health authorities. And just on that quick note, uh, the, the doctor who treated my mother was Dr. Patrick Kingsley, who has now sadly died, and he um, did pass on his protocols to others, and he did give us a list, and I'll, I'll look that up, and we can get that information over to them, Molly, but um, just as a matter of interest, the GMC, the governing body in the UK, asked him to stop treating people or lose his license, and uh, even though he's extraordinarily successful in treated thousands of multiple sclerosis as well as cancer patients, but he was asked to stop uh, curing people. Anyway, next question, Molly. Next question. Um, one of the attendees is citrus intolerant and said she can't find a vitamin C that she can tolerate, not even magnesium citrate or li liposomal vitamin C. Have you got any suggestions? Hmm. Is it citrate intolerant? Citrus intolerant? What did you say? Yeah, citrus intolerant. Hmm. You know, I mean, vitamin C is not citrus or citric per se. Um, I mean, I'm not going to try to argue anybody out of the fact that if they take something they don't feel well or it doesn't agree with them. Uh, but you need to you need to work with it a little bit. Why? By that I mean, like we talked about earlier, vitamin C, regardless of your allergies and sensitivities, is still 
the primary fuel upon which every cell in your body runs. So to that end, uh, if you, first of all, very simple, straightforward, uh, more frequent supplementation with much lower doses, preferably with a big meal or with a snack are probably going to be your, your frontline ways of trying to get uh, more vitamin C inside your body. But it's almost like we have a little mental fixture here and I'm not trying to be critical or, or, or judgmental, but you know, vitamin C, orange, citric. Vitamin C is not citric, okay? It's present in citric fruits, okay? But it doesn't mean like you're eating a capsulized form of an orange or something else that you might be sensitive to. And there are other types of vitamin C that are derived from other things, uh, beets, for example. And there are some places where it's completely made synthetically, which should not turn people off. A molecule is a molecule is a molecule. If you have a way in a laboratory of putting together the identical molecule that you have in nature and concentrating it, that's fine too. Um, another question is about vitamin C and cancer. So can it help treat all cancers and specifically prostate cancer? This attendee is asking about. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> all the nuances are far beyond the scope of this question. I have a, a lot of references and information source that that person wants to send an email and ask for the information resources because it involves a very involved protocol. The concept is simple. The concept is in order to reverse and cure any disease, you need to do two things. You need to repair, which means reduce and reverse the oxidation of oxidized biomolecules. You bring them back to their reduced state. But at the same time, you have to stop the influx of new oxidants or toxins. And when you can do both of those two things, magic starts to happen. But the thing is, is most people, most docs still don't realize where most of the toxins are coming from. And I'm gonna tell you, they're coming from the head and neck, the mouth. They're coming from colonization in the nose and throat, from an abnormal microbiome for which we do have ways to completely resolve it. And until you resolve all those other things, uh, your whole body is a, a Petri dish waiting for another cancer to crop up. But when you can knock out those things, wonderful things happen. And it doesn't really matter what type of cancer it is if you're able to stop the new oxidation along with repairing the old oxidation. Okay. Have, um, another question is, um, you noted, oh, it's about your book. You note in your book that um, root canals can dump toxins and pathogens into the system. Is vitamin C also effective? in treating infections related to root canal specifically? Sure, vitamin C, uh, we didn't emphasize this, I suppose, but <clears throat> in addition to being the ultimate antipathogen, <clears throat> especially antiviral, but also antibacterial, antifungal, it's also the ultimate antitoxin, okay? All toxins cause damage by one mechanism and one mechanism only. Wherever they end up, and that has to do with their chemical structure, wherever, wherever they end up in the body, they are deficient in electrons, and they're looking to take an electron away from a biomolecule. So in order to, for the toxin to stabilize itself, it needs to rob an electron from a biomolecule, which means it oxidizes the biomolecule, which means the biomolecule loses its function. So the more toxins and the more locations, the more oxidized biomolecules, that's your disease. Now, uh, vitamin C can come in and reduce those oxidized biomolecules after the fact, but also like with dental work and other things where you know toxins are coming into the body in the same time frame, into your bloodstream, into your lymph, when you can take something like intravenous vitamin C and meet the toxin in the bloodstream, the vitamin C can donate its electron to the toxin, quench it, and keep you from having any manifestations of toxicity. Um, another question is, um, 
would vitamin C help with other conditions such as Alzheimer's or diabetes? <clears throat> well, diabetes is actually the ultimate vitamin C deficiency disease. Remember what we said about vitamin C and glucose compete for the same transporter systems facilitated by, facilitated by insulin to get inside the cell, which means when you have an extremely high circulating level of glucose, practically no vitamin C is getting inside the cell. So you have relative to other diseases, a relatively profound deficiency of vitamin C inside your cells when you're a brittle diabetic. So yes, absolutely. Uh, diabetes is effectively a very advanced form of scurvy throughout the body because you're not getting the vitamin C wherever you need it. So um, uh, I forgot the other part of the question. And Alzheimer's as well. Oh, Alzheimer's. <clears throat> uh, I'll go back really quickly here. Remember what I said about all disease is too much oxidation and too little repair, too little repair and no stopping of the new toxins. If a chronic disease like Alzheimer's was due to a one-time dose of toxin and nothing else, you would be able to repair it with vitamin C and other antioxidants over a given period of time. But that's not the case. It's not the case because, and we have studies showing this, that Alzheimer's and probably all other chronic degenerative diseases, but Alzheimer's has in its tissue, in its tissue, chronic pathogen colonization, largely from the mouth. Porphyromonas gingivalis. So what does that mean? That means you have in situ, right in the tissue that you're trying to get to recover, you have a continuous ongoing source of new toxins. So let me tell you, I saw Dr. Huggins uh, resolve completely, resolve, let me, no, let me use the dirty four letter word, cure a number of cases of Alzheimer's, okay? It's not an incurable disease. It's absolutely an incurable disease if you don't understand the pathology and how to reverse and block it. Um, another question, will sorbic acid work for gut issues following a COVID infection? Absolutely. Uh, the, um, the best thing though for the gut following COVID and in general, okay, is hydrogen peroxide nebulization. The gut, especially with COVID, keeps the, continues to have the COVID pathogen down there, usually because you also have a chronic pathogen colonization covered by a resistant biofilm of COVID and other pathogens in your nose and throat, even if you don't have a cold or runny nose or anything, anything symptomatic going on in your nose and throat. It's still there. And when you swallow those pathogens 24 seven, you swallow exotoxins, endotoxins, a lot of free iron, all of these things that promote severe oxidation. And then you swallow the pathogen whole, which keeps the colonization, the abnormal colonization of pathogens in your gut. Uh, a good uh, sequence uh, and, and regimen of hydrogen peroxide nebulization, and I have a book on this, people can, can get the, uh, the download for free uh, can show you how to take care of that. But hydrogen peroxide nebulization, in my humble opinion and experience, is almost a magic elixir for most gut issues. Um, another question is, aside from supplementation, what else can we do to boost our levels of vitamin C in the body? You mentioned sugar. What are the most important other factors or dietary inputs? Well. I mean, anything that you eat that's not good for you that has some degree of toxicity is going to go against the net balance of vitamin C you have in their body. But that said, the primary reasons for vitamin C deficiency are going to be inadequate supplementation and either not realizing or refusing to address these hidden oral infections and mucosal membrane infections I'm talking about. This chronic pathogen colonization in the nose and throat is a pandemic of the greatest proportion. And if you had a cold five years ago and you haven't been sick since then, but you never did a biofilm stripping pathogen killing measure 
like hydrogen peroxide, not exclusively, you're going to be swallowing those pathogens forever, okay? When people start doing this, they, it's incredible, the change in their bowels, the loss of diarrhea. Uh, I've had a case of chronic Crohn's disease, his mother reported to me, his child was, her child was completely cured of that. Uh, multiple uh, females with uh, uh, irritable bile, completely elimination of that. Uh, people with uh, chronic fungal infections, very rapid and quick resolution of that as well. Because remember, the fungus doesn't spontaneously spruce up inside your body. It comes from an abnormal gut and it comes from the leaky gut that that abnormal gut is promoting. But you, you start sealing that gut by stopping the new, the new poisoning of it, which is what it is. It's a daily poisoning 24 seven. The ileum has stem cells that replace it every three to five days. So if you just stop poisoning the gut on a daily basis, you basically have a new gut, a new ileum in a week. Hmm. So, uh, this goes on to gluten allergies, all this stuff, all right? The, these are all things that have to do with the fact that you never give your gut an opportunity to heal. I have a, 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 also a video out there where, for those who don't know about it, go to YouTube, Dr. Levy Iron Video, Dr. Levy Iron Video, and you'll see one of the most nauseating displays of what they call enrichment of our food supplies. Everything that says enriched that's on a package is enriched with metallic iron filings. And if you think metallic iron is something you should be eating or ingesting, <clears throat> well, I don't want your scientific opinion on anything else. <laughs> okay, I think we only got room for about one more question, I think, Molly. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there's lots coming in. Um, I, know, I know. We've got. Someone who's previously had um, endocarditis, so would you recommend daily vitamin C as a form of sort of protection against that? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I recommend it for everybody, but especially those who might be even more prone to having uh, perhaps a injured tissue site. I mean, where you have tissue injured, those are going to be more susceptible places for any surge of pathogens in your body to set up shop. So absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, we would normally run on, but Dr. Levy did say, I've got to do another podcast with somebody else in a few minutes. I mean, he's, he's so popular. He's needed everywhere, this guy. So we do need to draw a close in, uh, unfortunately. Dr. Levy's website, by the way, is peakenergy.com. And as I say, he's very graciously... Uh, given us his email so all the questions you didn't get answered i know there are a lot he's he's prepared us or send on more more information but you'll find some on his website as well peakenergy.com and don't forget try the altrian offer it's 20 percent discount it's it's the stuff we take at home it's the best thing if you can't get iv um, so, so give it a go. Is a good chance to do it at a special discount. Dr. Levy, we're in awe of your knowledge. We truly are. I mean, it's astonishing what you know, and uh, we, we, it was a fascinating. We could have spoken for another three hours, but um, we sadly we can't. But so, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for your knowledge and for your courage, and for for carrying on the good fight that you are, which makes you a true doctor. And oh, uh, sad, sadly, too few of those. So bless I you. Appreciate, I appreciate those comments. Thank you very much, Brian. And I'm, I'm happy to come on your show. So uh, let's thank keep you getting the much. word out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you Tom. And uh, thank you, everyone. And use his email to find out more if you need to. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye-bye.